podcast. My name's Amy and I'm a junior doctor and running coach with an interest in sports and exercise medicine. On this episode, I'm joined by Barry Roberts to discuss avalanche safety. Barry is the commercial director of Wilderness Medical Training, which offers courses and expeditions for medics and explorers in Chamonix, the UK, Morocco and Norway. Barry himself has skied for over 40 years. He's an Everest summiter and paraglider pilot. He's also the contributing author to the Oxford University Press Handbook of Expedition and Wilderness Medicine and co-author of Staying Alive Off Piste. Today, Barry's joining me to discuss avalanche safety, including human factors, kit and terrain. So hi, Barry. Thanks for thanks for joining me. I, I know a little a bit about you from the wilderness medical training um, and reading a bit about your background. But would you mind just sharing with everyone else a little bit about you and also a little bit about wilderness medical training, too? Good morning. Hello, Amy. Yes, I'm Barry Roberts. I've been the commercial director of WMT Wilderness Medical Training for 30 years. And uh, alongside that, I'm very keen expedition guide, leader, and a lot of those expeditions have involved skiing. So I've had great interest in avalanche safety. I've had a, a previous uh, early um, background in uh, academia, doing some snow studies, some glacier research expeditions in the Himalayas. So I grew up in Canada too, so snow is uh, is in my blood. Can I say that? Is that the right kind of analogy to, <laughs> yes. to say? So I'm very interested in it from a personal point of view, keeping safe with my friends, family, and and working with with clients and and guests on courses in uh, in the Alps. And even though I've been studying it and immersed in it for years, I still I'm still learning things you know, every day or picking up on nuances uh, and trying to impart those by way of education on on our courses and our training events and can i ask what brought you um over from canada because i'll see there's much more impressive mountains over there i suppose so how come how come you find yourself <laughs> here that's a fair question there weren't very impressive mountains where i grew up in southern ontario but i did later work in the rockies and that's where i got a taste for for proper skiing but uh my work took me to kenya with uh, what is now Rally International, the expedition organization for young people. And by way of coming back through the UK, I, I ended up being offered a very interesting job. So I took it and I didn't go back to Canada. So I've been here for well, since the late 80s, full time. Perfect. And we're gonna um, discuss avalanche safety in a, in a bit more depth today. But I always think it's just a, a nice thing to do is to start off by defining what actually is an avalanche and what do we mean by avalanche safety? Absolutely. An avalanche is, is a falling or sliding mass of snow or ice. And typically that will also involve rubble, vegetation, dirt, rocks uh, and, and ice. Well, we often think of avalanches as those big powdery avalanches that we see in, in films. But from the backcountry user, the skier, the snowshoer, the, the, the snowmobiler, we're generally thinking about what we call slab avalanches. So they, they are masses of snow that form in a particular way that, that pose a hazard for us. So it's trying to identify where those slab risks are and and not not go near them and as you said you've kind of spent your whole life in this area and are still learning every day so it's obviously a very big topic that we can't do justice in a in a small podcast um but when we're thinking about assessing avalanche risk for people that are going to be venturing say off piste when they're skiing what are the first things that people should be thinking about when when looking at the risk in the environment around them there are many factors there is so much information to hand if you're going to a ski resort. So the first thing is to find out what the local forecast is, find out what the local avalanche risk is set at, and that's on a scale of one to five. And then, you st then you're starting to make your, your decisions about what you're going to do, where, where you're going to go, you know, how, uh, how you should be equipped, <clears throat> and crucially, who you should be going with. There's a huge body of work and thinking around the human factors in terms of going off into the backcountry. And these are things that apply to, 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 to all outdoor pursuits, whether you're a group of friends going kayaking down a river uh, or, or, or you know, body, body surfing. If you're going out in, in groups in, in the wild 
hill walking in Scotland, for example, there are a lot of human factors that impinge on the decision making of the group, which can or, or, or don't mitigate for the risks that are actually out there. Would it be smart to use this opportunity to dive into some of those human factors then? And I think specifically we were going to chat about some of the heuristic traps and how that applies to avalanche safety. Yes. So heuristics is a it's a it's a it's a sort of sounds like a bit of a psychobabble word, but it came into avalanche education in 2002 on the back of a paper that uh, Ian McCammon wrote, and he specifically looked at heuristic traps in recreational uh, avalanche accidents, and he identified four of these traps. And what he means by heuristics is that because the world is such a complex place, as we mature and and, and develop, we, we find ways to shortcut decision making. Um, so a bit like you know, crossing the road at the traffic lights, we go, we go into autopilot or even driving your car, we, we, we go into autopilot. Most of your listeners will have experienced driving down the motorway, getting absorbed in, in, in other thoughts and then you know, missing a junction. And they haven't. They can't even remember having driven the last two or three miles. So we, we learn how to do things fairly automatically. Otherwise, we would just be so overwhelmed with the minutia of gathering information, processing every every bit of that to try and make a decision and navigate our lives. So that's the background to, to that, that term. And he, he identified four specifically. We don't need to talk about all of them, but maybe, maybe we can just touch on a few and a few, a few examples. One of them he, he labeled familiarity. And what he saw was that people got into trouble even in places that they were very familiar with. So it's not as if they'd gone off somewhere new and were trying to work it out, trying to figure it out and, and weren't, weren't aware of, of a, you know, maybe a particular uh, black spot in, in, a, in the mountain terrain, but they actually got into trouble in places they were familiar with. So that suggests something about perhaps just being too complacent, uh, not tuning in to new risks, and perhaps just take it for granted that you you know a place, you've skied there lots, you've you've never seen avalanches, you've never had any avalanche you know problems or, or worries in that area, and so you go into autopilot and you get into trouble. So I think that's a that's a particularly useful useful one. That, you know that could apply to the to the outdoor user who goes off bouldering somewhere or free climbing, you know some easy easy terrain, you know places that they've they've climbed before, or you know, whether it's your favorite surf spot, it does mean that you should just specifically try and dial in to what may be new or may be different and don't fall into, into that trap. And he also talked about social proof. I think, I think social acceptance is probably a, a, better, a better term. And he explored quite a range of factors in the dynamics of the group and the group makeup. He looked at the gender balance within groups and saw that there were some patterns there that perhaps if there were a mixed gender group, there was a tendency for increased risk taking. So whether or not that's people trying to show off or feeling feeling emboldened in some way because of the dynamics with, between between genders, it's something certainly worth thinking about. Group size makes a difference. Clearly, the bigger the group, the harder it is for somebody to raise objections or to raise concerns about the, the plan, where the, where the group is skiing, if we're, if we're stick with skiing. And there's often a hierarchy, isn't there? Sometimes, you've, even if you don't have a, a professional leader or guide, there's, there's almost always one or two people in the group who are more experienced and, by default, perhaps leading, leading the group. So he, he talked about the expert halo and that we should be very careful not to automatically sidestep any, any, any input into decision making by just letting someone who's the perceived expert make, make all the decisions. Because that's, that's, that's often a very, very stressful position to be in. And I, I, I take my, my friends off piece skiing and ski touring. Sometimes just my wife and I will go. And there is, there is a subtle pressure there to, to give people a good time. Not just a safe time, but, but a good time. But I always remember that uh, one of my uh, great French colleagues, who's a mountain guide and ski instructor, Luc, Luc Bellon, he, for years, for a decade now, he's always reminding me, 
don't take risks to please people. And that's exactly, that, it's not, you're not even translating, that's, that's his, his English expression. Don't take risks to, to please people. And it's, it's something to take away, particularly for anyone listening who just takes their friends out on an activity or an adventure uh, and, and wants to, you know, wants to you know, enthuse them, teach them. Uh, just, just be careful, be, be careful. And I've learned over years that I, I, I could have potentially have objective A or objective B in mind. B might be a bit more gnarly, maybe a bit more scenic, have something a, a bit extra that A has. But I've learned that even if I take my friends on A, they don't know what they've missed out on B. They still, so they, they still have had a great time, and and everyone you know comes comes home safe. There's an expression in in my circle. My name is Barry. My nickname is Baz, and the expression is "You've been bazzed." So in the old days, I've taken people out, friends out, and you know had had a had a pretty tough you know long long day. You know achieved some some big objective, usually usually on skis. And uh, you know, and at the end, you know, people say you've been you've been bazzed. We've often talked about producing instead of t-shirts, so that I can give one to a friend that so you've survived. You, you've been bazzed. I try not to do that now because I find that my natural tendency is to do that, and and even to do that to my to my young children who are who are twelve and fourteen. So they're, they're pretty tough, but you know, and they, and they can tell you that they've been they've been dragged along on some big adventures. I, I digress slightly about from heuristics, but I hope that gives people the flavor that that even with the best intentions, somebody with a lot of experience can still lead inadvertently lead people into into danger, and you don't need to do that to have a great time. Yeah, and I suppose all of these things are quite intrinsic, but it's just about having that awareness and actually taking the time to think before just kind of going gung ho and trusting our instincts. Instincts it, it, aren't always yeah, best. It's, it absolutely is, and 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 when we when we try and decide what to do or scope out a plan, one of the other things that sometimes plays into this is this the heuristic of scarcity, and what McCammon meant was that, you know, people are always always want to get their their fair share, so. Imagine the the executive who's only got a, a long weekend to jet out to Geneva and get to get to the Alps. Well, you know, regardless of the weather or the avalanche forecast, he or she wants to get stuck in. They want they want to do something, and they may end up pushing themselves or or putting pressure on their guides or instructor to do something, just because their time is short. You know getting that adventure fix is is a scarce thing so they they want to do that and we see that in 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 Chamonix which where I'm based part of the year when we we run a lot of courses that after a, a you know a couple of days of big storms when the lifts area is shut or uh, it's just too foul to, to really go out as soon as there's blue sky and fresh powder then the mobs come out and it is it's a sight to behold that the the powder fever or the snow fever we see, people start to get pretty bullshy in the queues uh, to try and get out there and get those those fresh tracks. So there's a bit of an obsession with getting those fresh tracks. Personally, I'd la- I'd rather let someone else lay down those fresh tracks because I know, and not always, but if there are fresh tracks on slopes that might be potentially risky, I know that it takes somebody else to ski on them to reduce that risk enormously. They're much less likely to slide if I go on them, if someone else has, or a group has put down five or six sets of, sets of tracks. So I'm quite happy to let somebody else go first. I think that's also true about the length of time you spend out each day. I know there's certain people and I know my family can be guilty of it of just trying to maximize the time you're out and maybe skiing past that point where you're feeling tired and that's when accidents start to happen as well. You're right. Uh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes it is best just to, to, to call it quits and finish finish on a high. And I'm guilty of that too, you know, because particularly at the end, towards the end of the season, you don't know whether the weather's going to change. You don't know whether that's going to be your last run. So. You want to get, you just want to get your fix, and that is that just plays right to that scarcity uh, mentality, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and in terms of um, the skill in assessing avalanche risks, so if we just kind of set aside the human factors element mm-hmm. of it, what kind of things should people be looking out for when they're looking at snow and planning a route? 
um, what are the things to, to keep an eye out for? Okay. Well, I hope we'll come back to more of the human factors because I do think those are the absolute foundation and we've, we've only just scratched the surface. But I said earlier that at the very least, you want to know what the avalanche risk is locally. That's, that, that's important. That tells you an awful lot. And if we reflect on that and consider that in one French study of avalanche victims, and you relate that to that, that danger level, most of those, or the majority of those, over 50% happened when the, the risk level was, was three. And that doesn't mean anything until you look at the detail, look at the narrative attached to that, that number. And the scale goes from one to five, low, moderate, considerable, high and very high. So three is the considerable scale. So why do more than half of people in this one particular study I'm looking, I'm thinking about, why did more than half of those end up dead when the avalanche risk was considerable? I mean, for a start, just the word considerable should make you stop and think about where you're going. But we know that most people, back to the storm situation I was saying, you know, because there's pent up demand, most accidents happen in those post storm days, those blue sky, fresh powder days. So something's going wrong there if all those accidents are happening when it should be common knowledge and available knowledge that the risk level is considerable. So, you know, what should people do? You know, should they stop? Should they not ski? Not, not at all. I recently came across a, a travel insurance policy that had um, that, that covered skiing uh, but the one, one of the one, one of the factors in it uh, one of the conditions in it said that accidents weren't covered if you were skiing when there was an avalanche risk three I've never ever seen that before and I'm I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to travel insurance policies and I've never ever seen that before and I think well that that's somebody somewhere in in an insurance office who has perhaps looked at the, the data that I'm discussing and said all oh, right well if we if we if we don't if we say you're not insured if you ski when it's level three we'll have less claims. But that's that's absurd because there are lots of things and places you can go skiing when the risk level is considerable. So this brings us back to your question. So where can you, where can you ski even if you you know you're desperate to ski? You're not going to be told you can't ski, and you want to go out and ski. Where do you ski when the the risk level is still is still considerable? Probably the key factor is thinking about the angle of the slopes. If you stay on slopes below 30 degrees, then generally speaking, you'll be you'll 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 be pretty safe. Now, you know, never say never and never say always, but that's that that's one of the key the key factors. And so we're into talking about the terrain. So angle, the slope angle is is key. Slope aspect comes into it because certain developments and and, and certain uh, evolution evolutions, if that's a word, happen in the snowpack on other s slopes. So if we think about north facing slopes in, in the northern hemisphere where it's colder you get a very steep temperature gradient in the snowpack and so you end up with crystal development at the base of the snowpack which gives you a weak layer and that weak layer will set up often very early in the season because the snow is thin and it's particularly cold so the temperature gradient is even steeper and so you can end up with a, a weak a weak layer. Imagine a bunch of champagne glasses all piled up like you're about to make a champagne you know fountain. So high volume, weak, unstable crystals at the base of the snowpack. And over time, more and more snow covers covers that, and maybe it will collapse on its own and stabilize, or maybe it just takes a skier going into the backcountry trying to find a steep north facing couloir early in the season, that ends up being the person that, that triggers the avalanche. 90% of avalanche victims trigger their own avalanche or it's triggered by somebody in their, in their party. So it's not, it's not something that just happens. It's our presence there. It's our, it's our weight on the snow, which ends up collapsing weak layers or ends up putting forces on the snow so that the various layers in the, in the snow that have developed over the year. Think about the history of the snowpack. Every snowstorm, every 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 rain, you know, high rain shower, solar radiation on on the surface, 
effects throughout the season, all of those impart crystal development and layers in, in the snow. So I think about a, a club sandwich, lots of layers, lots of ingredients, and and not and sometimes not a lot of cohesion. So things things will slide, and sometimes all they all it takes is the is the weight of a skier to let them slide, or or, or the weight of a snow a snowmobiler. In America, uh, a large number a percentage of avalanche deaths are in the snowmobile population. Big powerful machines that can go deep into the backcountry quite easily. Steep slopes, bit like bit like motocross bikers, you know, doing these these trials. So you know, imagine the, the power and the weight of a of a snowmobile relative to a skier. It's just a, it's a recipe of, of, for disaster. So that's it's very very common. Not a problem in in Europe because we don't recreationally snowmobile. Yeah, I hadn't considered that too much. I think often when you're on a snowmobile, you you feel like you're a bit more protected because you're in a vehicle, I guess. Which actually the opposite is true, and it's you're not you're not actually protected within that. And it, as you said, it's a lot heavier. You're going to cause much more disruption. Yeah, you're not protected at all. And if you and if and if you slide and that that vehicle rolls on top of you, then you're in, you're in trouble. And when people are planning their routes and then deciding to to go ahead and ski, there's obviously overwhelming amounts of gear that, that people can purchase um to aid with their with their skiing is there any key bits of gear that you would recommend and you think actually there's a lot of evidence that they do improve safety um or at least help in situations where things do go wrong absolutely can i just come back to terrain just so i don't yeah forget. of course so, go for it. so i've talked about slope angle but we also want to avoid terrain traps so a, a terrain trap is basically any any land feature that is likely to increase the the risk of a deep burial or trauma because of the nature of the feature so being swept off cliffs would be a terrain trap being swept into forests or or, or rock boulder fields but more commonly perhaps skiing down a gully like a riverbed and and and, and, and setting off an avalanche and and that snow at the bottom doesn't have anywhere to go so it it just it it, it bottles is a bottleneck, and you're and you're at the bottom of it, so you're you're going to be buried much more deeply than if you were somewhere where the snow could fan out. Burial depth is related to unsurvivability. So, in simple terms, the deeper you're buried, the less likely your companions are going to be able to dig you out and and rescue you. So, if we're talking about gear and companion rescue, everyone needs to have. An avalanche transceiver, a shovel, and a and a probe, which is a like a collapsible tent pole, so that a you you're, you're you're transmitting from your beacon. Others can then search for you with their beacons, and then they have probes to pinpoint you once they hone in on on the signal under the snow, and then shovels to get you out. Sometimes I'll see somebody in, in a cafe who's taking off their jacket and they'll be wearing a transceiver, but they don't have a backpack. So I know they don't have a probe and, and a shovel. And I wonder why why bother? They might be able to find a companion, but they have no equipment to dig them out. And certainly their fa- companions can find them, but it makes no sense what, whatsoever, particularly because you know, the transceiver is the expensive piece of kit. You know, the shovel and the probes are relatively relatively inexpensive. So the very least you need to carry carry those. And I carry I carry that equipment almost every day, even if I'm going out family skiing. I never want to be in a situation where, oh, I'm lured to do something that I hadn't planned for and actually not be not be properly equipped. That would just be that would be a really silly way to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hope for the hope for the best, but plan for the worst yeah. is always the sensible thing to do. So those are the, those are the three things. But the key thing is learning how to use the transceivers. Listen, there are transceiver practice parks in resorts, so they have simulated transceivers buried, and you can go around and and, and find them and practice and have you know competitions with your friends and whatnot. So. You, you you can still have fun. It's a matter of you know we we say don't don't go if you don't know. So that that applies to you know, to, to the back country and even side country. So you know, that, that's another phrase now you'll see in the uh, in the literature, not just back country, which consider to be potentially you know, more unregulated terrain, if you like, or terrain that you need to to put in some effort to get to, so you can't access that from from a top of a lift. Uh, and 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 even just skiing on the on the sides of the piste, technically speaking, between the pieces, 
aren't managed and are not groomed by by resorts, but you can still get pockets of serious avalanche situations. And I've seen some, and I've got some fantastic pictures of some in, in, in Chamonix um, to, to actually to show that. So just because you're between the piece doesn't necessarily mean it's it's safe from an avalanche. I guess that goes back to um, feeling comfortable in an environment you're familiar with. You might feel a bit more comfortable when it's between the piece, but that doesn't mean the, the risk is is negligible. Absolutely. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So there's lots of fun places to, to ski between the piece, but there still can be cliffs, terrain traps, and uh, insidious slab problems. The conditions that, that might lead to a slab avalanche being released by the weight of a skier or, uh, or a snowboarder, th- they can be set up weeks, weeks in advance. It can be deeper in the snowpack, what we call persistent weak layers. And it's only towards the end of the season when the, the temperatures have consistently warmed up that you get more homogeneity in the in the snowpack and everything blends together properly and then we get spring snow up to that point we have to consider temperature in a different in a different way so in the early season cold temperatures prolong the risks persistent weak layers wrap increases in temperature increase instability so that's another thing to to think about in terms of what what the history is in in the snowpack. If I'm away from the Alps for for even two or three weeks, when I go back, I always have anxieties about what's gone on with the snowpack. So if I if I find myself in that situation, I'll speak to local friends who who've, who've been out there, get their get their opinion on where they've been skiing and what what they've been seeing. Because if you start if you see spontaneous avalanches, that's a red flag. So, so right right away, you should be backing off on your on your objectives and being being more cautious. That's 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 important. I'll speak to guides. If I see someone with a, with a shiny sheriff's badge who's a mountain guide, uh, I might speak to them. You know, and, and they'll always be willing to give you a heads up. Or I'll speak to the ski patrol. So there are a lot of people out there who know what they're doing, want to keep skiers and backcountry users safe. So don't be shy to seek that advice. Yeah, about being sensible and also just using the people around you and not assuming that that you know best. Uh, absolutely, and that comes back to the human factors. So if you're a, an informal party leader with your mates, you, you you want to start off the day by saying to everyone, well, first of all, you do your transceiver checks and and maybe you have a quick chat about what you're going to do if there's an accident, who's going to take charge, who's going to provide leadership, who's going to phone the rescuers and give them a GPS position. But nobody ever does that. <laughs> They, they, I have to say, I've never, ever done that. And it's it sounds silly when you say it. It's just, you know, when we say say at work, if we're doing, if we're on the cardiac arrest team, we always have a meeting in the morning and we all have our jobs and we know what we're doing so that when we arrive and it's all stressful, we just go to what we're doing and we know what we're doing. And actually, you kind of have to treat this situation in the same way, don't you? Just hopefully it will never happen, but just knowing what you're going to do when the worst yeah, it does happen and you don't freeze and panic and try and plan things when your brain is just not functioning anymore. Yeah, that is such a that's such a good analogy. And really, you should be doing that the, the night before you know, over a coffee, over a map as you're planning your route with everyone and just say, like, let's just let's just be serious for a second. If things go totally sideways, um, given the group and the ex- expertise, et cetera, so and so should take that role. So and so should take that role. If there's a victim and we dig them out, so and so is the most experienced first aider or medic. You know, they need they need to be they need to be there. They don't need to be on the phone, to, you know, calling in rescue or or, or whatnot. So you're, you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, and that's a that's a sensible conversation to have and it doesn't have to be a damp squib on the yeah. on the outing but it does have to get it does get uh, people dialed in and then in the morning yeah you know we, ch- we check transceivers and do a um a run through on that and again that just dials dials people into we're going into potentially avalanche ter- terrain and and always say to people look you know don't ever hesitate to, to say something if you're uncomfortable or if you if you think I've missed something, you're just not happy, or just have a gut feel. Just stop and let's just talk about it. You don't you don't want to shut down people imparting their own views of it. Uh, and it may be that the because you may have quite quite a disparity of people who are not very experienced and going along and trusting you, and others who 
are just keeping quiet because they're being polite. It's very difficult to speak up sometimes, especially if you feel like you're the least experienced. But actually, sometimes that not not really knowing or having any idea is sometimes when you realise the obvious things that maybe the people that are so focused and so experienced have missed. So it's yeah, definitely worth empowering the people that feel less confident to speak. It, it is. And it doesn't necessarily always have to be something technical like, oh, what's going on with the snow? It just could be encouraging someone to say, look, actually, they're getting really tired. And maybe actually you need to stop and reevaluate where, you, where you're at on the route and, and, therefore, and therefore not fall into the other heuristic trap, which is the trap of commitment. And that is this idea of you know, consistency, you know, sticking to the plan. And having a goal. Yeah, absolutely. That you're being, being determined ta- to meet. Yeah, like goal, goal, focus, tax, fixated, whatever you want to call it. And um, that is at play here as as well. Much better, though, for someone to fess up because they've got a blister. So that's slowing them down and giving them a lot of pain. And you, know, you need to stop and fix that. But maybe maybe the damage is already done. So maybe climbing up another 500 meters is actually just going to be slow. And then when it, it comes to turning around, the sun is set, temperatures drops, the snow starts to refreeze and get crusty. And then you're into a drama of skiing down crappy snow. When actually, and if you had turned around an hour before, you you might have had a nice ride a ride out. I'm giving you various scenarios here because I've I've experienced all of them, and I'm guilty as as charged. Um, it's taken me a long time to learn just to try and back off a bit, change that ratio between fun and and challenge, and still uh, still get out and enjoy the the mountains. And we, we've touched on it a little bit about what happens when things do go wrong and the importance of having a plan. And we're not going to go into the, the medical side of that, but I guess just from a first aid, um, those initial steps that anyone, even if they weren't medically trained, could do, what are, the, what are the key things? So obviously discussing the night before and having a bit of a plan, but what roles do people need to be considering and you know, how, how should people be getting help on the mountain and, and th- those kind of initial steps? It's a, it's a good question. So if you're in the Alps, let's, let's stick with the Alps. I've skied in Greenland and Pakistan and other places where there is no help. So you, you are have to be incredibly self-sufficient and therefore fairly conservative in what you set out, set out to do because you don't want a, even a twisted knee when you're doing a first, first descent on a, on a peak in, in Greenland. So let's, let's say, that's the thing about the Alps or, or in, you know, in a, in a resort in North America or New Zealand, where perhaps the majority of people were, will ski. So you're assuming everyone is equipped properly. You see, you know, every step of the way, if you think things things are getting risky and you have to ski down something that you don't want to ski, well, I always say don't go first. <laughs> so let someone else go first, and then go and go one at a time. So you reduce the the load on the on the slope, and you might have to traverse, take long traverses, so that you're not heading straight down uh, a, a risky slope. Long traverses, starting high up, so everything's going to fall below you rather than you know, you're not you're not going to be in the middle of the slope, and move down to what we call islands of safety. So you know, big big rocky outcrops. Uh, where you can wait and and then join people one to one. I've recently come around to thinking that having a couple of just basic walkie talkies, cheap walkie talkies, is isn't a bad idea when when ski touring because you can get strung out quite a bit doing what I've just described. And if you're 200 meters away waiting for the next person to come, it's probably easy for communication to break down. Might M- maybe add that to the group the group kit along with a first aid kit and a bivy, you know, some sort of bivy bag or kisu shelter. And, and I think one very simple thing people should do is, is cover their mouths, so zip up their, their jackets, pull their buff up well, on, well, well over their nose and mouth and, uh, and, and ski, ski down like that. Because if you do get caught in an avalanche, you don't want to block the airway with snow. If, if the slope slides and you're caught in it, try and ski out. Let's try and ski sideways. And if not, jettison your poles so you've got less weight, and then try and try and try and fight your way to the surface. And I know that sounds sounds easier than it, it probably is, but just try and fight, and you'll get disoriented. But try and fight, and at the very least, when you f- if you feel that the avalanche is settling, then 
cover cover your mouth, cover your and try and create an air pocket around your mouth. So if you don't get traumatized on the way down and survive to the point of being locked in and, and under the snow, if you've got an air pocket, that improves your survivability immensely. So now you're you've got at least one person perhaps buried under the snow. Uh, everybody else needs to react. But like at all these incidents, the first thing is, is scene safety. So you need to stop, think, assess. You probably want to designate someone immediately to call rescue services, give them your location, because if someone's been buried, they're going to be need to be evacuated. So you want to get get on the priority list. And in places like Chamonix, we have colleagues who, who work on the rescue helicopters there. We know how that system works. They might have a couple of rescues going on uh, at a time. They may have a rescue pending. And they'll just be prioritizing. The skier who, who re reports chest pain gets prioritized over the person with the dislocated shoulder. And certainly the, you know, the, the buried avalanche victim will get right up there on the priority list. But they need to know where you are. So you need to have a, a GPS or some app on your phone or a map. And then you then you need to designate searchers. And, and that means really, you know, probably the, a couple or three people who are most experienced with the transceiver searching. And they'll, they need to head down starting to search with their transceivers at the last point seen. So it might be the last time you saw someone or last you saw a ski or a hat on the surface. You want to head down the mountain and try and get as close to them as you can before you start the transceiver search. So in terms of pace, we talk about starting that at a, at a run to get within transceiver searchability, and then you go to a walk. Ideally, you want to still be on your skis because it's much better to slide around on your skis than clamber over avalanche debris. And most transceivers only have a range of 40, 50, 60 meters. So it's a very, very weak signal. So you need to get within that distance to pick up a signal. And you have to make sure that everybody else has turned their transceivers off because they're all transmitting and they're and either put them all on to receive. Otherwise, you're going to be searching for people who are on the surface. And that's that happens all the time. In the sense, if people are not involved with the search and they're somewhere safe, they should just turn their transceivers off. They don't need, need, even need to be on search mode. And then, then, you, then, you, then you try and find that um, that victim. And so when you get to, when you've narrowed down the search to a meter or two, then you, you start probing to, um, to, to, to find their body. And, and then you, and you start digging. So di digging them out is key. And basically you've got about a 15 minute window. So if someone is fully, fully buried for more than 15 minutes, their survivability falls right off the curve. So it's not a lot of time. Yeah. And I think that goes back to the, the planning the evening before. And also you mentioned calling rescue. I think having having those numbers on hand and knowing what to do, because I certainly am guilty of going to these places and having no idea how I would contact somebody. And if you've only got 15 minutes, you don't want to spend a few minutes faffing around trying to find the number and trying to then plan as well who's doing what. So I guess that all goes back to the, the planning. Yeah. I mean, the rescue probably isn't going to get there in time to dig, to dig out, mm -hmm. but hopefully they're well on their way so that if once you've got someone out if they're still alive then you can hand them hand them over and once you start once you dig someone out you, the key thing is, is 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 checking for an airway so if they're not responsive and and they don't and they have a mouthful of snow and they've been buried more than 15 minutes the outcome's likely to be pretty poor people die because they get asphyxiated uh, or or they get traumatized yeah Perfect. And we're not going to go into the kind of the next steps of the, the medical resuscitation and, and whatnot um, now. But I think that's just a really good over, overview of, I guess, hope, hopefully raising some awareness about preparation, some awareness of the human factors so that people maybe take a bit more time to think about what they're doing out on the mountains and have at least some idea of, of what the steps are if someone is buried um, and, and how, to, how to get help and how to start digging someone out. Is there any other final comments you wanted to to make or any stories that you wanted to share about your experience in terms of mountain rescue? Lots of stories, I suppose. I don't have any firsthand ones. Thank God I've never been involved in an avalanche, but I have friends and colleagues who have died in avalanches, who have been buried and survived, but have lost clients that they've been skiing with. So of all the sports that I participate in, avalanches account for 
most of the tragedies that I'm that I'm familiar with. Why, why do we think that uh, avalanches are and, and and avalanche deaths are different from other accidents? So you know, I guess we think about climbers. I guess it's rare for groups of climbers to to, to die. So there'll be individuals, etc. But I think it's often because you en- you can end up with multiple victims in the, the big avalanche stories that I could tell you about. You know, in Europe and in North America, I think it's when when, when you know when, when that happens, it's just more that more much more devastating to the community. So there's so much educational material available, so much online through the American and Canadian avalanche uh, associations, courses you can take to get it when you're out you know, actually outside next next season, videos, any books by American Bruce Tremper, so his latest book, fantastic very, very digestible guide to, to try and understand the avalanche phenomena. I would recommend a book by my friend Ken Wiley. The title of the book is called Buried, spoiler alert. And that is a sobering account of a, of a mountain man's life, including a very tragic uh, avalanche situation he, he was involved in. So I think all these things are important to educate yourself. Anyone can go and buy the, the gear and the equipment. But you know, you don't want to be the all the gear, no idea person. Join clubs, the Eagle Ski Club in the UK, where you can get involved with ski touring with experienced members and learn. And I think just just what you know, we've talked about packing, you know, first aid kits and shovels and whatnot. Just remember to pack a big dollop of humility in in your in your rucksack when you go out into avalanche terrain. Because the mountains are are big and powerful, and uh, they they don't they don't care that we're that we're there. Just learn, be cautious, have fun. But the the aim has got to be to you know to to come home safely with with any adventure, and um, and we all know that things can you know things can snap in the outdoors, and you know tragedy can can come out and seemingly nowhere but it doesn't necessarily have to with avalanche with a with the prudent approach you know some some experience some education choosing your companions uh, carefully um, and just just always being open to, to you know the, the the you can always turn around you can always back off and do do something else and uh, the mountains will be there the next day i think there's a lot of value in a debrief as well because i think fortunately most of us will be involved in situations that could have turned out turned out wrong or situations that were almost a near miss and I think it's very easy to go home afterwards and laugh about it which is which is fine but I think actually having a bit of a debrief about why that happened and what could have been done differently so that that doesn't end up being repeated it is quite important especially if you're going to continue the rest of the week skiing with the same group you could just end up being in the exact same situation and not going so well the next time you you can and uh and I think that's that's wise. And even if you just take one thing away from an event, from, you know, from an outing, et cetera. When we, when we teach our our big winter course in Chamonix, for, on the first day, I give an avalanche lecture because I know that the, our participants are all going out on the slopes, unsupervised, hooning around. And my aim is, is in the nicest possible way, is to scare them. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, and just and I give them a homework assignment to to tune into the risks to to, to look for the red flags that I've discussed to, to look at the safety bulletin board and whatnot and just get dialed dialed into it. And if people do want to find out more about wilderness medical training, could you just direct them uh, where to find you, where to find information about the courses, and also maybe a little glimpse of of what courses you have on offer as well. Uh, absolutely. You can find us at wildernessmedicaltraining.co.uk. Find our website there. And as we try to ramp up again since COVID, we've got some uh, courses we're, we hope to run in the Lake District this summer, uh, our Morocco expedition end of September, and then our winter courses in Chamonix for doctors and medics next year. So we we have some 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 small group courses which are ski based so that's a mountain medicine on skis course so it's well ski tuition and medical tuition so that's really really fun and then a bigger course which is 
more practical and le- lecture based with free time to to ski. So we've got quite a few things on offer and uh, fingers crossed we'll be back out on skis next winter. I'm sure we're lots of people listening that uh, that are missing it like uh, like I am. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time and, and for sharing all of that. That was really interesting. Thanks for having me. Many thanks to Barry for joining me on today's episode to discuss avalanche safety. If you want to hear more about wilderness medical training, then you can head to wildernessmedicaltraining.co.uk or you can head to Instagram and search Wild Med Training, where you'll find out more about the courses and expeditions that they have on offer. As I mentioned previously, Barry is the contributing author to the Oxford University Press Handbook of Expedition and Wilderness Medicine, and he's also co-author of the book Staying Alive Off Piste. If you want to hear more from me, you can find me on Instagram by searching Marathon Medic, or you can head to marathonmedic.com for more podcast episodes, blog posts, and route and training ideas. Many thanks for listening.